Next, we're going to talk about personality disorders. So individuals who are diagnosed with personality disorders exhibit stable, ingrained, inflexible, and most importantly, maladaptive ways of either thinking, feeling, and or behaving. So this is part of their personality. This is part of who they are as an individual. They are stable and intrinsic ways of thinking and feeling and behaving that don't change over time. So there's going to be, again, a little bit of overlap with our chapter on personality because this is maladaptive personality. Um, and so between 10 and 15 percent of adults in either North America or Europe are going to have personality disorders. The DSM-5 lists six distinct personality disorders. We're going to talk about each of these. Um, so we have antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, avoidant, obsessive compulsive, and schizotypal uh, or typal. Um, so we've already briefly touched on a couple of these in examples throughout this chapter, but go into more detail for each. So the first of these are antisocial personality disorder. This is probably the one that we are most familiar with. So in the past, individuals that fell into this category would have been referred to as either psychopaths or soci sociopaths. Individuals that fall into this category are usually described as the most interpersonally destructive and emotionally harmful individuals possible. So they are very destructive to society. Um, and a lot of the problems that are, are a lot of the things that lead to this is the fact that they have very little anxiety or guilt. They tend not to experience things the same way that other people do. So they don't feel worried about things. They don't feel guilty about the things that they've done. And this combines with their tendency to be impulsive. So they're going to act on their impulses. They're going to do whatever they want and then not feel guilty or anxious about having done it. Um, and this impulsivity ties into their inability to delay gratification of their needs. Um, so I'm sure you can see some discussions of Freud in the future when we get into some psychodynamic views of causes, but uh, we'll come back to that. Um, but yeah, so if a thought pops into their head, if they want to do something, they're just going to do it. Um, actual antisocial behavior is only going to occur in a very small portion of psychopathic individuals. So this isn't something that is overly common. It's not seen in tons and tons of people, which is probably fortunate considering how destructive they have the potential to be. In order to fulfill the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder, the individual has to be an adult, so at least 18 years of age, but it also includes an extensive background from when they were younger. So the patterns of behavior have to have started younger and have been carried through into adulthood. Um, and a lot of traits that they should start exhibiting to be classified as having an antisocial personality disorder are things like habitually lying, um, early and aggressive sexual behavior, excessive drinking, theft, vandalism, and chronic rule violations. So there's a whole pattern here that has to occur over a very long time in order to fall into this category. And that's why it only occurs very, uh, very infrequently. If we want to look at causal factors, and again, not loving the causal side of things, but factors that influence whether people have, uh, antisocial personality disorder or not, we can talk about our psychological or our biological factors first. Um, so again, another one that has a genetic predisposition. Um, if you are an individual that has this disorder, you are more likely to be related to other individuals who also have this disorder. It tends to be that concordance or uh, um, occurrence where people who are related to each other tend to all have this disorder, or at least be more likely to have this disorder. 
So evidence for genetic predisposition. We also tend to see, at least sometimes, dysfunction in brain structures that are governing our self-control and emotional arousal. So in studies, say with an MRI, they would see differences in the prefrontal lobes um, or weaker limbic input to the frontal cortex. So that uh, prefrontal area and frontal cortex all related into decision making and potentially into emotional arousal stuff. Um, and so the question marks again tell us that there isn't necessarily a lot of agreement between studies, but there is some evidence of some evidence pointing us in that direction. So there might be something going on there. Um, from that psychodynamic view that I hinted at a little bit earlier, that lack of impulse control, Freud pointed to that and said it was a lack of superego. Uh, these individuals are lacking the superego to control the impulses of the id. So, again, not a whole lot of evidence for that, but Freud would have liked to point to that aspect of this. Um, if we want to look at how learning might influence people developing this disorder, we see this issue where if these individuals aren't experiencing remorse or anxiety or guilt um, over their behaviors, it's really hard for them to experience any kind of learning associated with that because they can't be punished because they don't feel that guilt. Um, this carries over. We also start seeing there's no conditioned fear responses because the punishment doesn't really carry any weight for them. Um, so on the learning side of things, classical conditioning isn't really working in these situations to discourage that kind of behavior because they don't feel bad about doing it. Um, we might also see some modeling behavior where if they've uh, grown up in a situation where they experienced a lot of aggression, then they themselves might act aggressively. And some of this modeling may have come from uh, childhood. So as a child, maybe they were. Um, their parents were inattentive. They weren't paying attention to them. They weren't giving them the affection that they needed or something like that. Or maybe they're modeling by being exposed to deviant peers. So maybe they're modeling behaviors of uh, their peer group who are acting out. And so they themselves act out as well. Um, in terms of cognitive aspects that might contribute to this antisocial personality disorder, that's relating to the mind and how we think about things. So individuals with this disorder show a consistent failure to think about or anticipate the long-term negative con consequences of their actions. So when they're doing something, they don't think, oh, I'll get in trouble if I do this. They just do the thing that they want to do. Our next type of personality disorder is the borderline personality disorder. Individuals who are diagnosed with having a borderline personality disorder are typically characterized by having dramatically insta or dramatic instability in their behavior, their emotion, and their identity. So this instability leads to a sort of chaotic nature to them. And they have a lot of tendency to cause distress to themselves and those around them. So there's a lot of interest in understanding how these individuals think and how they operate because they have such a potential for a negative impact on society. Um, there are three sort of central features that relate to this borderline personality disorder. The first of which is emotional dysregulation which is where these individuals have an inability to control negative emotions. And this is especially in response to stressful life events, which is unfortunate because individuals with borderline personality disorders usually end up causing a lot of stressful life events for themselves. So not only do they create these bad situations, they then can't regulate their emotions in response to the situations that they themselves have created. So a kind of vicious cycle of problems there. 
Individuals with this borderline personality disorder also tend to have intense and unstable personal relationships, maybe creating those uh, stressful life events. Um, and so a lot of this is because of their anger. They're angry, they feel loneliness, they feel emptiness, because they don't have stable relationships. They don't have individuals that stay close to them. They don't have that support system that most people look to create. And a lot of this is related to the fact that they display impulsive behavior. So again, that inability to control impulses that we saw in our previous disorder category. Um, but individuals in this category, they show impulsive behavior like running away or being promiscuous or using drugs. So acting on impulses and not controlling their behavior. And these sorts of behaviors can drive people away. They can uh, sabotage personal relationships, which in turn can create negative life events that they have trouble controlling their negative emotional responses to. So all of these feed together and cause sort of a multitude of problems altogether. Um, and this is another one of those disorders that tends to co-occur with other uh, diagnosable disorders. So Borderline personality disorder tends to co-occur with things like mood disorders, PTSD, and even substance abuse disorders. Um, and so there are quite a few studies that have documented them kind of going hand in hand, probably due to a lot of the situations uh, that are created by all of these factors on this slide here. And when we start looking at factors that are related to developing this borderline personality disorder, um, we tend to notice that a lot of researchers point out that individuals with this disorder have chaotic personal histories. When asked to recall their earliest memories, they tend to report situations that are very negative, very chaotic. Um, so lots of reports of abuse or uh, unhelpful individuals or negative scenarios. Um, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because it's not necessarily clear if these events are very, very negative or if the individuals have a tendency to perceive situations as more negative than they really are. Um, so uh, individuals with this borderline personality disorder tend to view potential helpers, so individuals who could help them, as being less helpful than they should really be viewed. So individuals with this disorder have sort of a more negative skew to the world, but they do also tend to have more negative people in their lives. Um, and a lot of this traces back to their parents. So most people with a border borderline personality disorder had abusive parents, parents who rejected them or who were non-affirming. Um, basically not giving them a solid support system, not uh, starting them off right in the world. So it's kind of this interaction, this interplay between um, maybe if they had a more supportive environment, then their view of the world would be more positive, but also their negative view of the world leads them to interpret potentially neutral situations as being negative, which kind of perpetuates that cycle. Um, so again, a lot more complicated than we can get into in a brief discussion here. And it will come as no surprise that there are also biological factors at play here where there's evidence for genetic involvement when looking at um, close relatives being more likely to have this same borderline personality disorder. Um, there's also some evidence that maybe there's a biological abnormality in their neurotransmitters in the brain or differences in functioning in the parts of the brain that are contributing to emotional self-regulation. Um, but again, it's fairly vague because the research is rather recent. Um, we just know that there are some biological factors involved in potentially developing this disorder. 